Okay, uh, hi everyone. Thank you, Arman, for the introduction. And I would like to start with introducing myself. Um, I already uh, had a lecture here last year about front end. So, uh, as Arman said, I work at UNO as a lead front end developer. I came to Berlin from Ukraine two years ago. I've been working as a web developer for the last nine years, I guess. Time flies by. Uh, when I was uh, studying in the university, my specialization was mathematics. So I didn't have that much of a coding experience. So like most of you, I started my web career from the programming courses. After programming courses, I worked for the few years as a PHP developer. And when front-end became a big scene, I switched to be a, a front-end developer only. Okay. Uh, so uh, I want to say that I'm really proud of all of you. We are on the week seven today of JavaScript crash course, and you already learned a lot. We have uh, a backend project set up and running with its own database. And even last time, we learned how to cover it with tests. So today, we will learn how to write our own front-end application so that you will truly be able to call yourself full-stack developers. Um, before diving in, I would like to do a small reminder about JavaScript Crash Course Welcome Guide. Uh, we shared with you some instructions. And I would like to remind you to please install a Vue CLI library with the help of this command. It might take some time, so if you didn't do it at home, please do it now. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Somebody will come over and help you. And uh, also, please check that your backend is up and running and that you have a uh, few uh, meetups in your database because we will work with displaying of the meetups today. Okay, I think that's it. So after that, let's start with the front end. And I know uh, Arman explained it before a few times, but I would like to uh, somebody to raise their hand and try to explain in a simple English uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think front-end development is? Okay. <laughs> um, if I mean, if you have any idea, what what do you think is the difference between backend and front-end? Please don't be shy, somebody. I just need an answer from somebody, and then I will tell you how. Yeah, how do I think I can explain that? We have a lot of time, mm -hmm. so we can wait. <laughs> I know that, uh, oh, okay, we have a hand, or <laughs> mm. Okay, so this is everything that the user can see while we are interacting the web page, right? I agree. I would say the same. Uh, we have a browser, and we have a web page displayed inside the browser. So I would say everything that we see on this web page is front end. That was in fact the the sentence that we wrote while preparing for today, right? Everything that the the user sees mm. and touches is front end. Yeah, that's true. Perfect. Uh, as a um, uh, what is the difference between working as a front-end developer and a back-end developer? I would say that as a front-end developer, we, ha we have much more responsibility in front of the user because we are, uh, we are the developers who are developing the uh, user experience in the first place. So this is our responsibility to make a page work, uh, not only look beautiful, but also work fast have a good performance accessibility so that all our users will have a great experience, a stress-free experience. That is why, as a front-end developer, on a daily basis, we collaborate a lot with the design team. Even though we are not the one who are creating uh, design and UX, 
we are still uh, first people who can give a feedback about the design and the UX. So collaboration with the design team is one of our daily responsibilities as well. This is just a short overview in case uh, you will, after this lecture, you will get inspired enough to go more into a front end. Okay. So I would like to continue. I have our, uh, please, I would like to ask you to please open any web page. I have our JavaScript uh, welcome guide opened. And what I will do, I will do the right click and I will select inspect function. As, I know we, we saw developers tools before. On our first lecture, we was looking, working with console tab a lot. But today we will take a look at the element tab. If you are a front-end developer, you will spend a lot of your time here. What is element tab? This is how our, on, on the left side, you can see how, uh, how our web page looks when it's rendered. But on the right side, inside the element tabs, this is how our web page looks in reality. Here, there is a list of different HTML tags. What is HTML? HTML stands for the hypertext markup language. And the keyword is here text. Eventually, HTML was invented as a markup language uh, to present text in a nice way. What we can do, we can hover on different elements inside the elements tab. We can click on them and see different elements that there are inside. It also works the other way around. If you will pick the arrow here and hover on any element on your page, you will be, um, you, the element will be hi highlighted in element stop as well. On the bottom part of the screen, uh, in the styles tab, you will see the styles that each element has. This is CSS styles. You can think about HTML elements as the house. Meanwhile, CSS is a wallpaper that you will put inside the room to make the room look prettier. We will talk more about CSS in the second part. As for now, I would like to focus on HTML elements and how we can render them programmatically. For that, I will invite you to run our backend application. So please uh, open our code base and go to terminal. Click new terminal so that you will see terminal inside. After that, please go into our project into week seven folder. And we would write backend. Uh, please raise your hand to help me write the comments to write uh, to run our backend application. Okay, uh, please. Okay, nice. Thank you. Okay, let me take a look. Ah, address already in use. It's because I already have it running in my terminal window. I think uh, I will use uh, the terminal as a separate program, but feel free to use the terminal inside your VC code. Okay, so I have our backend server up and running. I will go to localhost 3000. And I will open meetup slash all. So here we can see the list of our meetups. I know I think to this point, you know this page quite well already. And again, I will click inspect and I will pick element tab. 
So as we can see, we have HTML rendered here. That means that we already know how to render HTML on the backend side. So what is happening? I will go inside roads folder meetup.js and I will check the URL that we use to display meetups. This is uh, road target slash all. Inside of it, we had res.render function. This is the function that renders HTML for us. And inside of it, we use list template. Let's go inside this list template and see what's happening inside. I'm opening views folder and I go inside list.pack. We're using pack template machine to display our page. Here you see that here, here we use h1 tag to display the number of items. Later we use p tag. And I would like to use this chance to practice HTML a little bit. So can somebody raise their hand or just say out loud any HTML tag that we can, that you know, and we will try to use it. H2, nice. <laughs> okay, so I'm typing H2 and just a text. I'm pressing save. Any other suggestions? Main, okay. Well, main is a special kind of tag. It is, it usually surrounds something. Wait, do I have it enabled? Okay, never mind. I will figure it out later. Okay, uh, I will add main here. Okay, it's working. Good. So we added few HTML tags, uh, saved our pack template. Now I will book, uh, go back to the page and reload it. As you can see, here we have our new HTML text rendered. Nice. The, uh, the only down, the downside is that to see the update, we had to reload the whole page. This is not exactly perfect. Imagine a mail application, for example, with the list of the emails that you want to check. Do you remember when 15 years ago we had to reload the web page with Yahoo Mail to see the list of the emails? What a nightmare. This is not what we want. We want our uh, web application to be dynamic enough so that without any page reload, we will see all the data updates. And this can be done uh, by rendering Java, uh, by rendering HTML, not on the backend, but on the front end. And it's possible because uh, each browser has JavaScript inside of it running. That means that we have our own programmatic language inside each browser that we can use for whatever. We can use it to render HTML, we can use it to render web pages, we can use it to navigate between them. We can build whole huge websites just on the front end. Of course, to build a big web uh, front end application, it takes a lot of effort. That's why we have great uh, front end libraries to help us with that. As Erman mentioned me before, nowadays, 2019, uh, two most popular front end libraries are ReactJS. and Vue.js. Today we are focusing on Vue.js. We will build our front-end application with the help of Vue.js library. 
but if you will be able to grasp all the concepts of building the front-end application with Vue.js, it will be really easy for you to later learn how Re React works as well, because two libraries share a lot of similarities and similar concepts. Okay, so I suggest uh, without further delay to dive in. I'm opening the welcome guide again. We will follow it now together. But before that, please raise your hand if you don't have Vue CLI tool installed. If you had some problems with running this command. Okay. Don't shy away. Raise your hands and we're going to come over and help you. Um, it's pretty important that we get these steps right. It's yeah. maybe okay if you drop out later in the, um, in the course, like in the last three minutes. But until then, let's follow on. So what is Vue CLI? CLI still stands for Command Line Interface. This is a program that brings us an opportunity to create a new front-end application with the help of the Command Line Interface. And as you will see, we would type only a few comments and immediately we will have a whole setup of a front-end application up and running, ready for us to program. And this is a good tip if in future you would have on the, during your interviews a code challenge and you would have to do some front-end application really quick in a few hours. So this uh, program is a must-have in that case, this tool. Because it will take only five or ten minutes and we will have the initial setup for a front-end application where we'll, we will start programming our first front-end app. So uh, let's do that. First thing first, if you are using terminal here, in the right top corner, there is a split button we would need two terminals for that. In the first terminal, you would have your backend code running, node mod index.js, and here we will run our front-end application. Okay, I will close that. I will go back to my terminal. I will split into tops here. And I'm going inside week seven. First thing first, I will type view dash dash version to check that our view CLI tool was installed successfully. So if everything is good for you, you will see the, the version of the tool. Please raise your hand if you have an error and you can't see the version of a tool. Okay, after that, I move into the next comment. And wait, this... wait, wait. Keep your hands up until we get this right. Um, I'm going to ask the, the assistants to, to walk around and help the people who have their hands up. Yeah, it... it's very crucial that you get the, this output correctly, V version. Just a reminder uh, if you don't have an access, to your global NPM package. Here in the bottom of the document, here, if, if for some reason you are not able to install global package, please follow following comments. This is in case if you can't install the package globally. Then you can install it locally and use it with the help of NP, NPX command just in case. Okay. Let's go back to command view create frontend. And this is the actual command that will create our frontend application. The third word here is optional. This is just the name of the folder that we will use. Anyone so. who needs, who still needs help? 
Did everybody get it right? I'm going to the new tab inside Vic7 folder and I'm typing view create frontend. After that, I will see a prompt with a few questions about uh, what kind of the setup do we want for our frontend application. So first question is, please pick a preset. I will choose manually select features and inside of it, I will select Babel, Rotor. I am selecting with the help of white space, ViewX and Linter Formatter. Just a reminder, if at some point you will get lost, here I write, I wrote down all the presets that I will select. So feel free to follow the welcome guide as well. After that, I press enter. Yeah, it is written down in the welcome guide. It's Babel, Rotor, ViewX, and Linter Formatter. Second question is, use history mode for Rotor. I will uh, select yes. Next is pick a Linter Formatter config. I will just uh, leave a first option. Pick additional lint features. Here I will select the second one, lint and fix on commit. I'm pressing space, not enter. I need only one of them. I mean, if you will get one of the options uh, wrong, it's not a big deal. The very first one is important where we're selecting the, pre the preset. Everything else is not that, that important. Where do you prefer pl placing config? I will pick the first option. And the last question, save this as a preset for future projects. This is your choice. Please raise your hand if you have any questions, because I will uh, pick no now, and after that, the installation will begin. Mm. Any questions? Well, uh, Well, you can stop and start from the beginning. It's not a big deal. Just remove if everything, anything was created. It's better to have router because if everything will go well and we will have enough time, we will definitely talk about router as well. If, if you want to stop at any point, just press Control C and it will stop the whole installation process. Okay. Is everybody set? If everything is good, you will see a prompt to do CD frontend and NPM run server. I will do exactly that. So uh, take a moment to notice that now we are moving inside frontend folder. From this point on, I will type all the commands for the frontend folder. This is, the front, uh, this is the folder that we just created with the help of VCLI tool. So this is a new one. And when inside frontend folder, I will do npm run server. This is the main command to start our frontend application running. Please raise your hand if you did everything successfully, if you're planning to follow me and so far everything is good. Okay, nice. And raise your hand and hold it if you wanna help, if there was something wrong. Okay. 
so we even have a, a hint to what our URL is. I'm opening localhost 8081. It might be that you will have different port. Uh, you, you might have 8080 port suggested. So please don't get confused. Anyway, if everything works well, you will see this exact HTML page on your screen. And con congratulations, this is our first <laughs> front-end application. This is how easy it was. It was only one comment in Terminal 2. Of course, this is a very basic default page. And now we will work further to display meaningful data here. Let's go back into our code base. Here we have our new folder highlighted green because it's new. Inside of it, we will go into SRC folder. This is uh, short for sources. And this is where we will work most of the time today. So first, I would like to ask you to go into the views folder and to open home.view file. Wait. Can I have a show of hands who didn't get this? If you don't have this, this file open. Okay, we're going to wait until everybody is on board. We're not going to continue until everybody sees this thing because there's no point in the lecture if you all cannot follow up. Um, so we have installed Vue CLI and we are running Vue Create front end. We're picking up a couple of options. Maybe we can show the options here on the screen. Um, these are the questions that you get, and these are the options that you choose. Um, so manually select features, Babel, router, VX, linter formatter, um, all, the, all the answers are here. Make sure you go through them and make sure you can actually create and run the front end application. Again, we're not going to continue until everybody is on board. Help your deskmates. Um, and we're also here to help you out. Genesis, can you help here, please? <laughs> if you get any errors about the front end folder, you can delete it and start from the beginning. It doesn't matter. You cannot make a huge mistake. It's, it's all under control, and we're going to help you out. The most important question with the setup is this one. Everything else is not that important if you will pick other options. I know this might, uh, might feel a bit confusing, but if you will now get used to this tool, it will be much easier for you later to start a front-end application. What? Uh, you, you can't hear me well. Ah, it's too loud. Well, that's OK. It's a small break now. We are setting up a project. A few more minutes, and we will continue. Please raise your hand if you still have a problem. There are few people who can help you. OK? So I will start with explaining view component a little bit. Meanwhile, you will have a chance to finish the setup. Don't worry. 
So here we have home dot view component. It's a view component and it consists of a few parts. On the top, you can see the template tag. And inside of the template tag, we have the HTML that our component renders. Hmm? Uh, really? Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, Arman, of course. Please raise your hands. We need to get this done. Um, anyone else? We're going to wait for you. We're not going to start until we have everybody on this page. OK, I will switch back to the welcome guide. Show of hands. Anyone else missing? Did everybody get the, the application running, the front-end application? It's OK to say no, and we're going to help you out. We don't want to rush. Does everybody have it? If everybody got it, got this page, um, I would ask you to keep a little bit quiet so that we can understand that um, it's not chatter, but ask for help. And if we're all set, we will go on. Are we all set? Are we all set? OK. <laughs> nice. Some of us are. Some of us say no. Um, If you still need help and somebody is not helping you right now, please raise your hands. I don't see any show of hands. Okay, there's one. OK, uh, make sure you're using the right port. It's localhost 8080 for most of you. For some of you, it could be 8081, as in Anya's case. Um, the right port is whatever it says on the console. So if you look at the, the terminal, 
when you run the, the front end npm run serve, it tells you what the port number is here, app running at local, localhost 8080. Again, it is for most of you. If it's 8081, that's fine. Um, you can also control click or command click there for in some computers, and you will end up at the, uh, at the browser. Um, just make sure you have the, the port number correctly. And I guess we're pretty much set for the, the remaining attendees who still need help. We're still here for you, and we will continue to work with you. Raise your hands whenever you need help. We're going to come over, and maybe we can go on with the lecture right now. OK, great. Um, before I forget, uh, I will ask you inside VC code to go to the extensions icon and type inside VTour. This is a very useful extension to work with the view library. It will give you a nice highlight, the same as I can, uh, the same as I have. So please install it. You will see the green button install. Just click it and well, I don't know what V2E is. <laughs> so please install just V2. This is just a list of suggestions. So let's go back to the home.view file. This is the one that we have inside SRC views folder. And as you can see, first it consists of the template part where we will put our HTML to render. And the second part is scripts part. I will do a small trick now. I will copy this part at top because this is how I usually write view components. So I just moved to elements and now I have script tag at top. What I will do next is I will remove everything that we have inside template folder. The reason for that is because I want to use the same template library as we use on the backend. And on the backend, our template library is POC. So I want to use the same template library on the front end as well. For that, I would need to install a special packages because by default, view doesn't work with Spark. We will have to add some extra magic. So let's go back to the welcome guide, scroll down, and the very last line npm install dash d pack pack plane loader. These are the libraries that will help our front end application understand pack templates. So I'm copying this line, I'm moving back to the terminal. And I'm stopping the front-end application as for now to copy-paste this command with Spark install inside. So after that, I would ask you to do the same. Please install these two libraries to help us work with Spark. Hopefully, it shouldn't take much time. And after that, I will again go back to npm run server command to run our front-end application. And the, the difference now is that I can go back to the template tag and I will type inside lang equals pack. That will let our application know that from now on I would like to use the pack language inside this template. Meaning that I can easily copy paste what we had on our backend side. So I'm going back to the list pack. And now here we are back to home.view component. And I will just add few lines inside template. It doesn't really matter what we put here. Just to demonstrate that now we can use pack template to render HTML. I'm saving the file. OK, I will remove this H1 long line, and I will only have Hello World. 
After that, let's switch back to the browser and see what we have now. If everything go, went well, we will see the hello world prompt. I'm reloading the page and here it is. So we just rendered our first HTML with the help of pack template inside home.view. Please raise your hand if you need a help. The, there is a question here. After that, I would like to move further and start talking about state management. So what is state and what is state management? Let's take a look at uh, some web application. I will open meetup.com. As you can see, this is a big website which displays a lot of data. For example, here I have an element that we, which displays and other elements inside of it. More precisely, these are cards with event info. Here we see the location of the event, the name of the event, okay, the date, the location, the name. And if I will click on the cards, we would see a new HTML page with same data about the event, but displayed in a different way. That means that when we are writing a big website, we will have a lot of different components that might display the same data. For that, it would be nice to have a single source of truth to store that data so that each component can read from that single source of truth. And in view, this place where each component can read from is called state. But it's not that only we need to read from the state and to display data. We also need to be able to modify this data, to change it. That's why we are saying that we will talk not only about the state, but we will talk about state management. In Vue, state management is done with the help of the Vuex library. I will open the official website. Here there is a video. You can watch it at home later. I will scroll down because there is a nice picture a diagram that I will use to explain state management for you. And we will start with the purple circle, which says stated state. As, and as we can see, our view or our component is able to read data from state and display it. After that, the management part goes. So what if from inside our view component, we would like to change the state based on some user interactions. For that, we would need to call a special function that in Vuex is called actions. And calling action is called with a special word as well. Uh, the word is dispatch. So in order to change a state from the view component, we will dispatch an action that will later change state and if the state changes, all our view components will automatically update based on the state change. This is, uh, this is convenient. Also, this diagram is called one-way data flow, meaning that we always know in what direction our data should go. First from state to a view, and then through dispatching the action, we can send an action to change a state. If we will scroll a bit down, here is a same idea, the same diagram, but with a little bit more details. Oh, so it's like zooming in a little bit inside. Again, we have our state and we have a view component 
that reads data from state. And as I said, then we're dispatching an action. But there is one thing between action and state. This is one extra guide, uh, guard that guards state from unnecessary changes. The thing is that in our actions, we cannot change state directly. For that, we for that we front-end developers or creators of UX library came up with another en entity, which is called mutation. Mutation is, is just a function, usually a very simple one, and this is the only function that has direct access to state. So in order to change a, sti a state, we would have to first send the call the mutation function or special word commit that we will use inside code. And then this mutation will change the state. So a little bit more steps in between. Why it is so? Why we need so many special functions with special names? I would say that the easy explanation is the code, is the organization of the code. This is the same as somebody will organize own wardrobe or the cabinet, let's say. We are putting things where we are expecting them to find them later. So if later when we when well, our application will get bigger and we will and when we will need to debug it and see where the mistake is happening or where certain logic is happening, this structure will help us a lot. With the help of it, we know that mutation is this one specific place where the state is changing. Meanwhile, action is the only place that causes mutations. Okay, I know this is a lot of information so far. I would suggest to try to write a code and try to see how we can implement this diagram in reality. As you remember, when we were setting up our application in the preset, we already picked Vuex library. That means that when we will go back to our project, inside SRC folder, we will have store folder. This was already created by us by Vue CLI. And inside there is index.js file. Now it's empty. There are a few properties inside. There is state, mutations, actions, and models. And we will start with adding a property to a state. So uh, a, bit, a bit of a spoiler. Today we will try to display the meetups that we have in our backend database. So I will create a meetups property inside our state, which for now will be an empty array. Or even better, I will start with a more simple property. I will start with a counter, sorry, but it will be better for demonstration. So I will say counter equals zero. And that means that we have a property inside our state. Now what we want to do is to read this property inside the component. So we will do this part, reading from the state. I'm going back to our home.view component. And to display data from a state, I will import a special function. So I'm typing import, figure brackets, and inside I will have map state. Map state is a special function that comes together with Vuex library. So I will type import map state from Vuex. This function will help us to read from the store and to do some magic on the background so that once the data in state 
or in store are updated, the data inside component will be automatically updated as well. To use it, I will have to use the computed property. This is a special property of the view components. This is an object. And inside of the object, with the help of the spread operator, I will call map state function that we just imported. Ah, okay. True, true. Thank you. View X. Okay. I had a typo. Now going back to the computed property, I'm passing an object inside of the map state. And uh, the property will have the same name as we just used inside of the state. So I will type counter. Counter will receive a function state, which will return state dot counter. First, the syntax might look confusing, but don't worry, you will get used to it eventually. That, uh, that just means that we are specifying that this particular component with the help of map state will use the counter that we, ha that we have inside of our state object. Now, I would like to display this counter property inside of the template. I will print div under h2 tag, and inside double curly brackets, I will print counter. So if everything works as expected, we would see the value of the counter on a screen. And now this is zero. I'm switching back to browser. And here is zero, the counter that we defined inside our state. But now we need to not only display the state, we would like to modify state as well. For that, I will go back into index.js and now we will add the action here. The action will be called increment counter. What else we can do with the number, right? Inside the function, there is a list of parameters in, quail, in figure brackets. And uh, the first value is commit. This is the function that we will call later. And the state, so that we can read the current value of a state. I will create new variable, new count. And it will be equal to state counter plus one. So what I'm doing, I'm just incrementing the current state value by one. But this is just a variable. We need a way to set it up inside of the store. As we saw on the more complicated diagram, inside of the action, we, the next step is to commit a mutation. And for that, we have the commit function inside parameters. So I will type commit. And first parameter here will be the name of mutation. And I will name mutation later set counter in quotes. And I will pass this variable inside as a second parameter. So. What I did is I used the commit, fun the commit function. First argument is set counter. And the second argument is our new count that we just incremented. Now I'm moving to mutations. I will create a mutation. 
I already named it, so it will be called set counter. There is a small difference between naming actions and mutation. As you can see, for naming mutations, we I, I used capital letters. Uh, this is one of the code agreements. It's not necessary. It's just a nice way to tell apart actions and mutations. And this will be a function as well. It will receive first uh, argument state and second argument new count. And this function will be really simple. I will just change the value of a state because as I said before, mutation is where actual changes of the state are happening. So I'm typing state dot counter equals new count. So what did we do so far? We have a state with counter equals zero. We already displayed it inside our component. After that, we have an action in increment counter that increments counter, and it passes this new value inside mutation. And mutation is the one responsible to set up, to change state counter to this new value. Now, uh, we have everything ready. The only thing is missing is that we want to call this action that we just created from inside our component so that we will be able to see that change in a state from the component is possible. I'm going back to the component. I will use another helper function for that. So here, after map state, I'm adding comma and I'm typing map actions. This is another function that comes together with Vuex. And to use it, I will use the methods property. Again, this is a standard word for the component. Inside of it, the syntax is a bit similar. Three dots, map actions. I'm calling this function. And I'm passing the object inside. What I will do is I will use the name of the action increment counter to map this action to the increment counter value. So this is the syntax. Increment counter, increment counter in quotes. And now we need we will have to call this function. In reality, the call of this function can happen anywhere. It can happen as a reaction to the user clicking on a button. It can happen as a reaction to user scrolling a page. But I will start with calling this function the moment our component is created, because this is the easiest uh, way to demonstrate the state management thing. So there is a special word created. This is a method. And inside of it, I will type this increment counter, and I will call it. That's it. That means when our component will be created, increment counter action will be called, which will increment the counter, commit a mutation and our state will be changed. As a result, our view will be automatically updated so that we will see the new counter inside. It won't be zero anymore, it will be one. Okay, this is what, this is the expected behavior. Okay, uh, so, uh, there was a hint from Arman how to make a syntax a little bit simpler. So please uh, pay attention. These functions are quite smart. You can use them in a different way. And we are quite lucky there is a simpler way. 
So instead of passing the object, I'm passing the array inside. And the only value that I have inside of the parameter is the first inside map state, the counter, the name of the value from state, and inside map actions, the name of the action, increment counter. So the changes that we change the object to the array, and the property is now in quotes. It still works, so it's all good. I wanted to ask Next, to install a special Chrome extension that will help us view, uh, work with Vue better. So if you now have some time on your hands, please look for the Vue Chrome extension. It's called Vue DevTools. I will just copy the link into Slack channel, OK? And, uh, Click Add to From button. Add extension. After that, you will see this extension in your top right corner. Please click here. Oh, maybe I need to reload the page. And it should say Vue.js is detected on this page. After that, if you will look through the tabs that you have. OK, no. Open DevTools and look up. Close the panel. So reload the page, close the panel, open it again. And after that, in tabs, you will see this extension that we just installed, Vue DevTools. This is very convenient extension if you work with Vue. For example, on the first tab, you will see all the components that you that you have now in your application. And the second tab with clocks is a very useful one as well. Here we can see all the mutations that we sent. And till this point, we sent one mutation, set counter. Below, there is the name of mutation and the arguments or the payload that this mutation receives. And in our case, it receives one. And you can see how the state looks like after this mutation happened. So our current state has counter with one property. OK, I will uh, continue. And now we, uh, now we would move further. And as I promise, we would display the list of the meetups that we have in our current database. Before that, I will do one small explanation. The, the thing is that is the state of Vuex and database on a backend might seem a bit similar. They are both, they are both a source of data that we can get and display. The only difference is that state on the front end is only saved inside the memory of the browser. That means that once we are refreshing the page, our state is loaded again with default values, and everything happens from uh, 0.1. Meanwhile, the database on the backend, the data inside database, they can stay there for months, for years. That is why now on our back on our front-end application, we will request data from the backend, from our permanent database, and we will try to display it. For that, again, we need our backend application up and running. So localhost 3000, meetup.all. And I will go and change this page a little bit. The thing is that, that, the thing is that 
front end and back end for them to communicate together i will use a special format that is called json i think you had a chance to work with it before but i would need a special backend endpoint or url that will not return the html as here but will return the json for us so for that i will temporarily become a backend developer and i will go back to our backend application inside roads folder meetup.js and as you can see here we are using res.render function this function renders html to render json i will use other function what i will do is i will copy this router and uh, i will add slash json to its name and i will change render function to send and the only argument that it will receive is our meetup array okay let me save it so what did i do i copied the url the router i changed the name a little bit i added json in the end and instead of the render, I am using send function now, which receives method meetups as a parameter. I'm going back to localhost 3000 to our backend application. And let's check how our new URL looks like. So meetup slash all slash JSON. Nice. As you can see, now on this endpoint or on this URL, we are receiving data in a JSON format. This is exactly the, front, uh, the format that our front-end application expects. It might be, though, that on your screen, you can see this data a bit in a different way. This is because I have another Chrome extension installed to display JSON in a nice way. So. I suggest to install it for you as well. It's called JSON Formatter. I will send a link again in Slack. So it's not necessary, but it will help you to see JSON in a nicer way after you will install it. Here you can, uh, this is how you probably see JSON originally. This is the raw view. And this is the parsed view which is, that is much easier to read because very often this JSON file will be really big and if it's displayed in this way, it's really hard to see the data inside. As you might remember, before we used Axios library to communicate with backend. We were using it to create new meetups. We were using it to delete meetups. Now we will use Axios library inside our front-end application to fetch this data from this URL and to display this inside front-end application. What I will do is I will go back to the terminal where front-end application is running i will stop a server temporary because i would like to install the axios library i will type npm install axios please do the same okay just in case i will type the command here After that, I'm back to running a front-end application. So now we have Axios library installed, and we will use it inside our store to fetch data from the backend. I'm switching back to front-end folder, src, store index.js, the one where we just added actions and mutations. I'm going to the imports and I will import 
Axios from Axios. And I will create a new action to fetch meetups. It will be called fetch meetups. Again, it will receive commit as a parameter. And inside, I will create a variable called result. And I will call Axios library. Here will go the URL of our backend application, the one that we just created, the one that returns the JSON files. So I will copy this line. And I'm going back. It will go inside here, okay, almost. OK. One thing is missing. The Axios is a sync request. So I will add a wait in front. And await always goes with a sync word in front of the function. Do we need dot get after Axios? Yeah, we do. So Axios dot get, and after that, parentheses and the URL inside. As for now, I will just console log the result because I want to make sure that we get what we expect. And I will go call this method from inside our component to see the, that Axios request to backend actually happens and we receive data that we expect. So going back to home view, I'm changing increment counter to fetch meetups the action that we just created and inside created method i'm calling fetch meetups there's a typo in fetch okay thank you Okay, please raise your hand if you have a question or have troubles following. Now I'm going, I will go back to Browder and see what uh, what is the result of fetching meetups will be if everything is good we will see the json that we will request from the backend so now i'm on the local host 8081 and i will refresh the page and go see the what is the console log will return unfortunately it returns nothing but instead, we see the error, access to uh, request from origin has been blocked by course policy. No access control allow origin header is present on the request resource. This error is a worst nightmare of the, of the front end developer. This means that you need to go to your colleague to your back backend colleague and ask to change the setup of your backend server. Who likes talking to backend engineers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but we are lucky. We are full stack engineers. We can ch we can change our setup ourselves. And it's not that hard. I will use the course and PM package for that. 
By the way, this error is there for a reason. That means that we are not accepting any request and given any data. That will be a nightmare for, for the security reasons. So it makes sense that on the, our backend server, we need to allow for somebody to ask that data from us. You can see how popular this package is. Weekly downloads, two and a half million. You're not the only ones getting this error. Apparently, two million developers are also getting it every week. <laughs> True. So now I'm stopping the backend server. We are backend developers now. And I'm typing not inside front-end folder, but inside week 7 folder, where the backend project is. I'm typing npm install course. Not only I need to install this library, unfortunately, but there are a few lines of code. Likely, each package comes with nice documentation. So we will just copy code from here. Fortunately, it's only two lines. So first, we need this line. And this line will go inside our main backend file, which is objects. So on the third line, I will insert it. I'm requiring course from course. I will change var to const just for consistency. And the second line is up.use course. This I will insert on the line 10. After that, hopefully our backend will be ready and we won't see the error anymore. So what I did is I required course on the third line and under the up equals express, I typed up.use and called the course function. Let me go back to the terminal and run the backend server. Again, node mon index.js. So what we did, we practically eliminated the security guards there. And we said every single server on the internet, every single web page can access our server and request data from it, which is why this isn't a very real use case. Normally, course has further configuration. And you say only this type of server or coming only this URL um, will be able to access my application. For now, for practical purposes, we don't give it any configuration, which means everybody can access our server if they know our IP address and such. Um, but I encourage you to check out the configuration of course module. Course means cross-origin resource sharing. And we don't really want to share our resources with other origins that we don't own. So um, that is something we always have to configure on each um, project that, that we have. OK, now let's go back to our front-end application and check if our error is gone. I am reloading a page. And yeah, perfect. Now our console log worked. And here we can see the array of data that we received from our backend application. And the main property is data. Here there is our array of meetups. I have three meetups in my database. You might have different quantity. And now what we will do is that we will create a new mutation to set up this property inside state. And then we will read this state in uh, this property inside our component and display meetups instead of zero. Let's do that. Back to index. .js. I will create a new mutation. It will be called set meetups. Also, I need to create new property inside state meetups as well. And by default, it will be an empty array.
And yeah, let's go one by one back to our fetch meetups. We didn't, we forgot to commit a mutation here. So the second line will be the commitment of mutation instead of console. Console I'm re removing. So we will commit set meetups. with a typo, of course. And we will pass result dot, dot data because data is the original list of meetups that we are receiving. Result dot data. And here again, the commit we receive as an argument. So let's take a look. We have the async function fetch meetups that sends the Axios request to our backend URL. After that, we receive data. And in the end, we are committing our new mutation set meetups with result data. Now let's go and edit the and create the set meetups mutation because as for now, I only copy pasted it. The difference is that now we receive data as a property, and instead of the counter, we will change the meetup property. So we will send data inside meetups. So as you can see, we set it up state meetups to data that we receive from the backend. I'm switching back to the front end, reloading the page. We don't see any data display yet because we only added the action and mutation, but we can see what is happening inside our view dev tools. As you can see here, we have the set meetups mutation sent, and we can say load the state after this mutation to check if now inside the state, we have the meetups array and it's here. So this is the list of meetups that we just received from the backend. Now, all we can, all we should do is to display this meetups inside our component. And for that, I would need your help. Can somebody tell me what I should do here to display meetups? The hint is that it's really similar to the display of counter. Again, meetups is just a property inside the state. So how we can read this property from the state and to display it inside our template. <laughs> we might be looking like we're running out of time, but we're not. We're going to take the extra time um, to wait for you, please. Anybody, how do we display state on the front end, on the page. We did it with the counter. It's already out there. Just shout it out. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. OK, we just nice. add meetups instead of counter or next to the counter. That's why it's actually an array. An array means multiple values. So you can fetch multiple values from the, from the state. Counter was one. If you want, you can do comma, counter, comma, whatever you want. Um, but it's not everything. We still don't have it displayed in the template. Yes. So we need to do one more thing. What else? <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. OK. Now. <laughs> Amazing. That is amazing because this is the data that we requested with the help of the JSON format from the completely different URL, from the completely different server. So on the front end application, we are displaying data that you currently have inside your backend database. This is quite good. Well, uh, our next plan is to talk about component decomposition and it's eight. 30. Yeah, maybe we should take a break. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. But... <laughs> okay, let's this is the break. first time ever that everybody's dying for a break. Um, let's take a 15 minute break. Warning um, today's session will also include CSS. We might go a little bit over time. Um, you'll be free to leave whenever you want, of course, at 10, whatever. Um, but if you're really interested in everything we want to tell you today, we're going to be here a little bit longer to talk to you about CSS and what amazing things you can do um, as a result. We're going to have a 15-minute break. If you have any questions, raise your hands, come to us. We're going to solve them. And let's meet at um, 2050. First part of our lesson, we learned what state management is. We were able to create a state to fetch data from the backend server, to save that data into state, and to display them in our front-end application. We will start the second part with talking about second important uh, front-end concept, which is called components decomposition. I will open again the meetup.com. And as you can see on the home page, we have some elements that have a repetitive UI, meaning user interface view. For example, in the events section, we have events cards that look the same, but they only display different business data. But their UI is similar, and, the, and their behavior is similar. When I'm hovering on them, there is a shadow. They have buttons with a hover effect, which are clickable. And when I click on the event itself, it's always the same behavior. We will end up on another event page. Below events, we have groups. And groups, cards, also are repetitive elements. They have a picture on top. Uh, they have title, number of events, number of people. That means that very often our front-end web application will have components with the repetitive logic. And we don't want to copy-paste this logic through our application. Instead, we would try to put this logic into separate component and reuse this component in the several places. This approach is called component decomposition. Um, inside categories, there is another example of the cards that repeat themselves. And what we will do now is we will go to our meetups list, which is now looks quite ugly. We will try to create the meetup cart as a separate component and reuse it to display all, our, all the meetups that we have inside database. OK? So let me go inside components folder. And here we have hello world.view. I will remove everything inside. And I will rename this component. to meetup cart. OK, before we will start, let me ask you if you, uh, if you let me ask you about components decomposition. This concept is a little bit complicated, but also it's very important. So maybe I, I uh, maybe I wasn't able to display it nicer. I don't know, maybe Arman, maybe you can help me and add a few things. <laughs> OK. Um, so we were talking about decomposition. And that means breaking things down into its parts. This is very crucial in any development. 
in programming, but it's also really crucial in front end. So what we do here is we see a, an, a page, right? This is a single page. However, nobody programs this as one single HTML file. There are parts of it. There's the header. There's the filter. If you scroll up, we're going to see the, the header, meet up, start a new group, log in, and sign up. Um, that, that functionality doesn't change per page, right? Whatever page you go, you have, this, you have the same login. You have the same header, the same logo, the same functionality of logging in. And if you log in, it should show your account name um, and probably your picture, et cetera, right? Um, these are shared concerns. And usually, there will be teams or developers that will be taking over these concerns, a team that will be responsible for implementing the header, implementing parts of the header, like the login button. And what happens when you click login? You go to a login page. When you are logged in, you show the uh, picture of the user, right? This all is a single unit of development that doesn't have anything to do with the, the rest of the page. So we say, OK, let's give this to another team. Here, um, probably we have multiple teams implementing this page. And we want to slice up our work so that it's easier to maintain, to manage, and to develop. So probably there is a team that is responsible for developing the, the events near you section and showing the events there. And how do we ensure that these teams are not depending on each other? but completely um, develop their projects independently. We do this by breaking our page while in the architecture phase, while we're architecting how this should work, by breaking it up into components. And then we give, I don't know, three components to a team, five components to another team. That's why it's very crucial to break down your application into separate components so that you utilize your resources. And I'm not only talking about human resources, but um, your energy, your time, um, and your thinking better. So as Anya said, we have the, the card here for the events near you, or we have groups near you. These are components that are repeating. It's very easy to, to say, OK, if something is repeating, I'm going to create a component from it. That is the first thing we, we always do. If there are repeating elements, let's create a component for it and reuse that component. Um, what if there are, you know, you don't see really repeating elements? Like the groups near you as a whole is not really repeating. It's only one section here. But it still makes sense to make it into a component because probably it has different concerns than the events near you, than that section. So when we look at a page, we try to identify these different groups of elements on the page that have unique concerns. And when we identify them that these are uniquely different than each other, we then break them down into further components or parts. I hope that that name component isn't very confusing um, for you. It just means a part. So unique parts. A unique part is a component, like the, the tires in a car, right? That's a, that's a component. The engine is another component. The, the team that builds the tires don't build the engine. They are completely separate. Probably they don't even know what the, the other team is actually doing. And that is, a, that is the exact case for our front-end applications as well. So I don't know. If you scroll down, maybe let's see. Um, we already talked about categories. Is there anything else down there? Um, how Meetup works. So this is a totally different concept, right? This is one can call it onboarding or introduction, tutorials. That's another concern. Or what we call call to action. What you should do when you see this page, maybe you want to download the app. So learn more. And these are the, the download links. You can also make this into a component. So for a component to exist, it doesn't have to be repeating. It just has to be a unique concern. Okay, That is not your page's main concern. And the, this page's concern is to bring all of these components together. Why does it make sense to add to, to make this get the app learn more part a component on its own? Maybe right now you're not using it on any other page. But in the future, it's very easy if you build into a, a single unit that is contained and self-sufficient. It's very easy to just take it and use it um, anywhere else. Think about the Legos, Lego bricks. 
we have, I don't know, maybe 60 different types of Lego bricks. And you can build anything from a small Yoda to a huge spaceship to machines that, that are working with batteries and stuff. Only with those 60 components. That is why component decomposition is really important um, because we want to be, we want our applications to be composable, which means whenever you're building a new application, you should be able to pull in different components and create something entirely new that doesn't require custom tooling or building custom modules or custom Lego blocks, right? Um, this is basically what component decomposition is. Given an um, item like Yoda, how can you build it with Lego blocks? You have to break it down. You know, you're, you're designing the ears should have 30 blocks of this size, 20 blocks of this size. I'm going to bring them together like this, and I'm going to build the ear of Yoda. Yoda is a um, character in... <laughs> if... Well, I, I learned recently, so that's why I'm, I'm trying to use it in a sentence to show that I learned it. Um, <laughs> I'm not a Star Wars geek, never. I didn't even watch the movies. Um, but this is why we need component decomposition, decomposition. We need to be able to compose our applications from um, shared tools. And if you look at these two sliders that, that has multiple contents. Oh, wait, there's a great example here. Do you see the button here? There's a weird space to the right of it. And the button here, it's centered. The arrow is centered here, and it's not centered there. It suggests me that they didn't use the same component there. But they should have. If they did, they wouldn't have this problem. Right, because this is something that scrolls. It's a concern, scrolling things on the screen, showing three or four of them, whatever, and then going to the next one is a concern. That's why it should be a component. And then individually, you can say, I'm gonna show these cards, product management or group cards here. And in this one, I'm gonna show event cards. So event card is a component, but the, the scrolling list is another component, should be another component. Apparently, they didn't do that. That's why they're running into consistency issues. It's also why it's very important to have, you know, component decomposition as part of your architecture phase. When you're designing a page, nobody should say, OK, I'm going to use a completely separate logic to draw this on the screen so that it looks like this weird. I don't know. Is there a reason for it to be offset to the left? No, right? That should behave exactly like this one. And even more so, you probably don't need to write your own scroller. Probably there's a third-party scroller out there that somebody wrote already. So you should just take it and use it instead of building your own. Don't build things on your own unless you have to. If somebody already did it for you, use it. And there are millions of libraries online that you can use for this. So um, they failed this course. Probably they didn't do a very good job of breaking this down into further components. I seriously, literally cannot believe, this is the first time I'm seeing this discrepancy right now. I cannot believe how they missed this. But, um, you know, not everybody is doing a great job. This is why we're having this course. This is why we're going to go a little bit over time today, because we want to make sure you get these points really good, really correctly, so that when you go and start your engineering careers, you don't do these things um, when you're building web pages. So we have multiple components. They are probably sometimes invisible. But you always have to think, what are the common concerns here? There's a common concern, scrolling items. When I click the buttons, they will scroll. This is one concern. It has to be one component. Um, I'm going to show the, the group card. I'm going to show the event card. There you have two more components. So um, this is how you break down a page into multiple components. And then there is the, the call to action where you get the, the application and stuff. So question? The question is, is it possible to have um, the same component having it behave differently in certain special cases? For example, the scroll, let's say. Um, it starts from zero and it goes to left, right? Uh, to, 
to right, right? I, I don't even know what is my left and what is my right. Um, so you can see that at the start, you cannot go back right now. You cannot go to left. And you might say, OK, for events, it makes sense to go, go to right only. But for the groups near us, I'm, I want it to be circular, which means I also want to go back. Even if I'm at the, at the beginning, there should be a button that will scroll to, to left here. And of course, you can do that. You can configure components. Components are meant to be configurable. Um, they should be very flexible so that when this comes up, you know, you develop this. And then a year later, a developer came up and said, hey, but I wanted to scroll backwards as well on the first page. You should be able to implement that in the component. You, you shouldn't create a new component just for that, just for that specification. Um, your components should be configurable, even if it was not at the very beginning. After this requirement came up, you should be able to implement it so that it's, you know, it can scroll back. The, the first users of your components shouldn't be affected. Their usage shouldn't break. They shouldn't need to update their code. But the new users should be able to make use of the new functionality in their code base. Do I make sense? Um, every component should be configurable with certain properties. And in fact, this is how you configure these components, like the groups near you. It is a, it is a component to display a group, right? How does it know which group to, to show you? It is configurable. It takes a group. It takes a picture of the group. It takes the, the title of the group, the, how many events they have, right? And how many people they have. It takes these as configuration. And then it prints this on the screen. So even these components are already configurable. The list components. How many configurations does it have? Um, probably a couple. First, which type of list item it is? Is it a group or is it an event? And then how many items there are? What are those items? These are all configurations for that list item. It could show the list of attendees, for example, in another setting. Or it could show a list of pictures that, is, that are taken in an event. These should all um, be configurable. And that's actually what we're going to see, I think, in a couple of minutes, how to create your own Meetup card and how to configure it with certain properties. Okay. Is it OK? Is it a little bit more clear why we need a question? I call them cards, like playing cards. We call these things cards because they have shadows and they look like playing cards. This is a proper name that front end, um, not only developers, but designers also use. Um, a card is a user interface pattern. It's a special pattern. Everything is a template. But a card is a special user interface pattern uh, where you see the borders. And you can distinguish it from the, the rest of the page. And sometimes it has um, shadows. Sometimes it doesn't, depending on your taste. But it contains information for a single item. That's what a card is, a user card, a event card, a group card. These are called um, cards. Different user interface languages call them differently. I think Apple doesn't call them cards. Google call, calls them cards. So Google Material Design calls them cards, and Apple is probably has a different name for it. Um, but I think this is you know the ubiquitous language of, of front end and, and UI. Another question. Wait. For consistency, um, the, the, the group that meets to design each of these things talks about cards. Is that right? So yes. each group is in charge of a card or, or parts of a card. Yeah, probably. OK. I just I didn't know the terminology. Thank you. And this is called a design language or a design system. And you set up your terminology within your design system. 
if you're creating a new design system for your company, then you define these things. This is a card, this is a, um, an action, this is a button, this is a success button, this is a secondary button. You know, you have a list of vocabulary that you all agree on, both your business stakeholders and your developers. This is called ubiquitous language. Okay, let's move on. Okay, thank you very much for the explanation. No I'm moving back to the components folder. I created a meetupcard.view file there. And um, it will have the same structure. It will help script tag. And uh, I will copy the syntax because it stays the same. So we are creating a new component and the name will be meetup card. It will have a template as well. So for now, I will leave it empty. We will define what's happening inside Meetup Cart a bit later. Let's start with importing it inside Home View so that we could use it to display our meetups. And later we will come back and uh, add HTML to the template. So I'm going back to home.view. And here at top, we already had an import of hello world. So I will just rename hello world to the meetup card. And here as well, meetup card. And as you can see, we are saying import meetup card from components folder. And here, this is a special word. And that means that this folder is inside SRC folder. This is an alias for the SRC folder. After that, I am re renaming here hello world to the meetup card as well. Now we can use meetup card inside our template and try to, as Arman said, try to pass some properties inside to modify its behavior, how it will look like inside. So first, first what we will do is we will use a special view directive, which is called v4. And, the, and we use something similar before on the backend. On the backend, this function was called for each. So what this function does, it goes through the elements inside of the list and uh, displays, for example, one by one, or applies some other logic. In our, in our case, it will be the display. So it goes v4 equals three. Okay, <laughs> um, so we have a V4 directive and inside of the quotes, I will type meetup in meetups. That means that we are going through meetups list and for, and for each meetup, I will display meetup name. As for now, we didn't use our components so far. I only changed the display to the v4 directive. So now in our browser, instead of the array, we will see the list of the names. But now we want to move this display of the names to our meetup card component. And uh, hopefully this is an easier part. I will just instead of the HTML, the name of the HTML tag, I will type the name of our newly created component. So I'm removing div and I'm typing meetup 
slash card. And now I will remove the display of the name because now it will happen inside meetup card. So I'm having meetup card and inside of it V4, meetup in meetups. After that, I will use a special word that is after after that i will pass meetups inside the cart as a property so that we could actually display the information about the meetup inside of the cart this is done with a special u syntax uh, here i type the name of the property it will be called meetup equals in quotes meetup and this is the property that I get while interacting through our meetups array. Okay, I'm saving it. And now we will go back to our meetup card and try to display meetup property inside of it. Okay. First, we need to define inside the child uh what properties it expects and uh, for that i will use prop property it will be an array and now we so far we passed only one property which is meetup so this is the same property the same name as i am passing here Okay, going back to meetup card, I added props property. And now all I have to do is to display the name of the meetup inside the template. I will use div name. This is just a CSS class. It can be any name here. And inside goes the meetup property, meetup.name. And I can also display location. These are the properties that we have inside our object anyway. Okay. So div.name and inside curly brackets, there is meetup name and meetup location. Let's see what have we displayed now. So if uh, inside view DevTools, I will pick the first tab. We can see that we have our home component and inside it calls meetup component. And when I hover over component, I can see how they look like inside browser. And now if we will change something inside this meetup card, uh, it will change through all the cards. This is what it means when we say that we are reusing the logic. Um, for example, I can add a style property and we will call and we will talk more about styles later. But as for now, I will just do name color gray to demonstrate that each property will be applied to every card. I'm saving it and page reload. As you can see, the color change for each card. This is how decomposition can, can help us so that we won't have to be repetitive and we will define any business logic in one place. Okay, any, any questions or maybe uh, switch back and forth? I can, yeah, let me, Copy paste it to this lecture now, as I did before. This will be meetup part. And I will update home component as well. So we are updating past messages. Question? Yeah, please. I have a question about uh, in home dot view when in this in the template when we put mm -hmm. meetup dash card, but when we imported it 
<laughs> we wrote it differently. Yes. Is that, why do we do that? So um, at the top we have, yeah, with the Camel Case meetup card. And I imagine I would try and put that in yeah. template. The, the, the top one is called Pascal Casing, where all the okay. um, words start with a capital letter. And the one at the bottom is called Kebab Case. Uh, it's, it's like a shish kebab. So you have pieces of meat and a shish going through them. Um, and the reason for that is meetup card is a class. So in JavaScript world, it's best to make it Pascal casing. However, when we use it as a tag in HTML, HTML is case insensitive. However, we always use as a um, convention, we always use kebab case for tags and properties, um, tags and attributes. So it's, you know, div is in lowercase. And like, um, if you have, for example, a data attribute, it's data dash something. Um, we use kebab case for tags and attributes. That's why there is a discrepancy there. However, I believe if you type meetup card in Pascal casing, it's still going to work in a template. Um, they just try to, you know, give you multiple options to write your code the way you like it. Thanks. No worries. Any other questions? Are you sure? Are you all with us? I, I feel a little bit like we're down on energy. Why is that? Let's talk about it. And let's fix that because what is coming up next is super interesting. Wildly interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. The CSS part will be amazing. Please stay with us till that. Yeah. I have seen a couple of people left us, which is, you know, okay. maybe for the better. <laughs> Whoever is remaining with us, I expect you to have a little bit more energy. Do you have any questions? Are you lost on anything? It's totally fine. Tell us if, if you need to explain certain concepts more. There's a hand over here for help, I guess. Um, so Mert, um, one here, two over there. Why is it called computed? Perfect question. Let me talk about that in a little bit. Um, do you need help? Another question. Yes, please. What is the difference between methods and computed? All right, I need a couple of assistants to help over here. Uh, please come over here. We have one hand, two, three. I need three assistants. Please ping the ones outside. And we have three people here. Help them out. Move, move, move. Um, so the first question is computed. Yeah, of course, like they're, they're here. They should do something, right? Uh, we're not utilizing them enough. Um, why is it called computed? If you can scroll up a little bit. We have a section called computed in our, uh, in our components because these values are not defined here. These values will be computed outside of other values. It's very literal. Um, methods are methods that we call. They're actions. They're like class methods that we have used so far. And computed, computed is a short for computed properties. Computed gives you properties that are computed from values that are coming from somewhere else. And in this case, we are mapping the state meetups. It's, it's very literal if you look at it. Computed properties, and we start by mapping the state, and we get the meetups property and use it as a computed property, which means whenever that meetups change, the computation will change. And therefore, the template will update. And therefore, the user interface will update. Does that make sense? What is a computed and how is it different from a method? A method is an action that you call to do a certain operation on the objects. And computed is a property. It's not a method. You cannot call it. It's not a function. It's a property that is dynamically generated based on other values. And here we say it's based on meetup in the store. So whenever the, the meetup value in the store changes, this is also going to change. If you remember, we have a method called fetch meetups, right? That is also coming from the, the store. And we use map actions to, to get it from the store. Whenever we call fetch meetups in the store, that list of meetups will change, which means the meetups property will change. 
which means we need to reflect it in a template. And we only do that by using this computed properties. And that's, this is the syntax of how we use it, computed um, and then map state. Does it make sense? What is a computer and how is it different than, than a method? OK, perfect. Another question. Yes, please. Sorry, I couldn't hear very well. Yes, we have computed methods and created. And what is a created property, right? That is the question. Yeah, the question is what is created. Created is a special method. Think of it like constructor of a class. Whenever you create this component, that created is called. It's like an event handler. Um, again, exactly like a constructor. We don't have a constructor here because this is an object. This is not a class. And if we had a class, that would be the constructor. So whatever goes into the co constructor method of a class, which means the actions, the code that you run whenever that object is created, will go under the created method. Created is a method here. And that encapsulates everything we have that we want to do at startup. Whenever we're creating an instance of this component, we want to fetch these meetups. If you create multiple of these home components, home is also a component, you will call fetch meetups multiple times. It's exactly like a constructor in a class, which you already used in your code before. Any other questions, please? Where is the fetch meetups method? It's defined in our store. So, Ani, if you could go to store index.js, it is defined as an action in our store, fetch meetups. Why is it here? Because it's manipulating data. If it's manipulating data, it is best if it's very close to the data source. And the data source is the state here. That's why we put it in this file. And then we map this to our components and then call it from our components. Our components are calling these actions. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is a function here called fetch meetups. And in the home component, we use a special function to map this as a method in the original component. It's a little bit confusing, but bear with me. Fetch meetups is defined here. It's a function that is defined on the, on the store. And if we go to the home component, Anya, Thank you. If we go to the home component, what we do here is we are taking that action from the store and putting it inside our component with the help of map actions call. So we have our method here. Nothing, nothing stops us from defining fetch meetups here and then doing the Axios call here. It would work. However, it's a terrible idea because data management isn't the job of components. Components are there to display data. Data management is the job of a store. That is why the action is defined in the store, and we, have, we are mapping it to our components, because we want to be able to call them from our components. And this is how we do it. Once you do this map actions fetch meetups, you can call it with this.fetch meetups. Another question. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. Yeah. The question is, or the, the, the comment is, or the explanation is, um, in store index.js, we are defining a Vuex store here. Vuex is the library we use for data management. And we are defining a store here. And then um, I think it's in our main.js, right? If you go to main.js, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. In our main.js, this is where we create our Vue application. And we take the store, import store, and we pass it to our Vue instance. So this is how we make sure our application knows about our store. And from then on, whenever you do map actions or map states, Vue.js knows, hey, this is the store. 
this is the actions in the store, this is the state in the store, so I'll be able to map it, the state or the actions to the components. This is the glue, if you will. We define the store, and here in app.js, uh, sorry, in main.js, we are gluing the store to our components. Now, we didn't talk about this file. This file is automatically created for you, which is a great convenience. Um, you don't have to deal with this. But if you want to do it from scratch, it's very approachable and humanly writable. You can write this, and it's, it also um, works with, with your own custom-built projects. Um, but yeah, this is how we make sure our application knows about the actions and the, the properties in our state. Any other questions? Are we all set? I want to hear if we're all set. Are we all set? <laughs> Thank you. OK. Do we have any other content, or do we move on to our? Uh, yeah, I, I like to talk about user interactions. User interactions? Yes. OK. Um, let's do that. It will be, I think it will be the last part. Yeah. Um, so, so far, we learned how to display data with the help of the components, we even decomposed uh, our page to have few reusable components. Uh, but we didn't talk about user interaction so far. And it's an, and it's an important part, part of any web application. Because when you're going through browsers, you're not only reading the data, you also interact with the web application. For example, if it's a shop, you're clicking on the items, and they, they end up in your cart. And then you go through the whole checkout process and you enter your data. Uh, so let's add an example of the user interactions. For that, I will go to home.view and add a button component here. Button is a perfect example of the interactable element. So I will have button, and this is a special HTML tag. It doesn't come from you. This is a part of HTML specification. And uh, the button will have a text inside. The text will be increment, because it's, that is what our button will do. It will increment the counter that we already created in the first part. And uh, below the button, I will display again the counter value. Let's save and take a look. OK. This should, there should be a diff around it. So here is our increment button. Uh, I'm clicking on it, but nothing really happens. Uh, what I would like to do is when I click on the button, I will call the increment counter action that we already have inside our store, so that the counter under the button will uh, will be increased. Where is the counter? Uh, it's not displayed because I removed it from the computed properties. Let me add it back. So now it should be here. So when I click on the button, I want to in increment 0. There is a special syntax in view for that. And it's an easy one. So inside the brackets, I will type add click. And that means that this that I will define something that will happen when the click on the button happens. And inside, I will just call the increment counter method that we already have. Let's see. The thing is that I removed increment counter, so I need to add it again into inside map actions. OK. And now I will reload. And I will click increment. And I see that our counter Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's what we want to do. And 
if if we will check the view dev tools we will see that we called set counter multiple times so i think this is the point where i will stop and i will pass the microphone further to my dear colleague Nora, who will uh, talk a little bit with you about css because let's face it css is a big part about being a front-end developer thank you that's amazing yeah um thank you anya that was great this is magic right in if you if you paid attention in the last couple of seconds what we did was we added just two lines and made a a counter that we already built before and um what we did was just by adding those lines we made our application interactive and you'll be able to do that in your homeworks as well some of your uh, complex interactions are like this like a a i don't know a user post like a comment create a new comment right you'll be doing these things in your homework so i expect you to pay attention to what we did here you know we just added a at click increment counter that is coming from the store we just mapped that action from the store increment counter is coming from the store and um on the button if you can scroll up a little bit here on this file um on home home that view if you scroll up a little bit or or down sorry down um we have button at click increment counter and um that is basically how we made our application interactive so i expect you to have more buttons and more interaction that's called axios.get axios.post whatever um in your <laughs> store to make your application work no. now this was a great lecture so i want another round of applause for anya And our next speaker will be Nora. Mm -hmm. Yes. You. Okay. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, it works great. Okay. It's, it's, I'm surprised. <laughs> uh, that it works so well, right? Yeah. Usually when you are a developer, you don't believe <laughs> something when something works for the yeah. first time. Yeah. It never works for the first <laughs> time. Yes. Um, I won't take much of your time to explain how proud I am because of course as you guess I'm very proud to have Nora with us tonight as well mm -hmm. she's been waiting for this for a very long time um, and I had a great luck of working with her for a couple of months before I left UNU because as you would guess we were working together at UNU before um, but she has more to tell you so without further ado give it another round of applause for Nora All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the thank you for the brave ones and the not super tired of you that are still here. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it worked for the first time, but maybe not the second time. Yes. Okay. And yeah, and the glass is also it's it's great. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's amazing. Uh, all right. So. Thank you, Anya, for doing the very, very hard part. I feel very privileged to do the fun part and the creative part. Uh, personally, CSS is my second uh, favorite part of front-end development. My first favorite part is writing uh, accessible and very good HTML that is uh, usable by as much uh, as many people as possible so and i have one comment to do uh if you feel confused if you feel overwhelmed uh just the only choice you have is to embrace it because it will not go away anytime soon i i'm still it, it's a sign that you that you are growing that you are learning stuff so it's a very good indicator that you are in the right path um so, a uh, very few words about me. I'm working at UNU the last one year. Uh, it was the November uh, last year, actually, that I moved from Sweden, but I'm originally from Greece. Uh, so, I really remember the time when I, I joined the Slack community of women tech makers, just pinged people and say, okay, I'm looking for a job. And 
in a matter of minutes, Arma, Arman jumped in. So this is how the journey started. And just a reminder to use the communities around us. When we are looking for jobs, when we are looking for help, it's the first place to go. So I'm obviously I didn't miss this opportunity, right? If if somebody is looking for a job, there are I'm not the only one. There are multiple people waiting for you to come in and say that you're looking for jobs and then we reach out to you and see if we can work together and i'm i had great competition so nora gave me a very very hard time while i was trying to sign her because she had like i think three or four other offers on the table and i was like oh my god i i have to work with this person and um and i'm very lucky that i had that opportunity in the past which means unu is a great place to work not a shameless plug. This is why we're all here. Um, at the end of this course, you're gonna, we're going to offer uh, a position, an internship position at UNU. So you will be able to um, experience this for yourselves. But yeah, that was a very hard time and a couple of nightmares for me. You know, what happens if I cannot sign her? Um, but I'm, I'm super, super excited for this right now. Sorry for the, this plug. Okay, this is new information for me, but okay, nice. Yeah, of course, because I have to keep my cool, right? <laughs> when we're discussing our contract and, and everything, I'm like, yeah, yeah, everything is fine, and, and we're, it's going to be great and stuff, but like, I, I'm shaking and trembling. Like, will she accept our offer? Uh, because every company is in dire need of developers. So um, another shameless plug, don't um, think that you have to apply and get this job. They have to get you. You have the upper hand, not the companies. The companies have to hire you. They might try to trick you for a lower salary or um, you know, different conditions. Don't accept it. You have the upper hand. If you're fit for the job, you can ask whatever you want, and they have to give it to you. Otherwise, they, they won't be able to um, find a replacement. And yeah, sorry again. <laughs> Excellent tip. I, I couldn't agree more. So in order to get you a little bit more pumped, I will get uh, to show you the end result. So I think I remember the URL. If not, I will look it up. Uh, so, okay, the title is loading uh, in the top and this is okay. Okay, <laughs> this is our end application somehow. Uh, okay, well, that's unfortunate. It worked on my machine, all right? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, maybe the deployment failed. That's why we need the next course uh, taught by Chan. So yes. every <laughs> one of you should be here. Do not forget. So let's go back to our... Um, application and what we have right now first of all i want to make sure you are all seeing the same page you have a list of meetups you have a button you have the counter that is uh, working so if not please raise your hand we have some people here so what i will do is um, first of all anybody knows what is css yes please I think you know, you are a front end developer, right? Okay, so you know what, okay, <laughs> if you want. Would you like to the microphone? No, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so CSS is a way to add styles and colors um, font size, so you can change how it looks at your components. Mm -hmm. um, so it's cascading style sheets, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can you do is just decide how you want to make your components look like, and it helps you to make a lot of creative things to it. And depending on the um, sizes of the device, you can also make it responsive. So things will change um, as you go, depending on the conditions of the device. Okay, that, that's a, a very, that, that's a great definition actually. And who of you have used CSS before in one way or another? Okay, please stay. <laughs> All right. 
Um, so maybe someone is old enough to have a MySpace account? Okay, nice. And uh, so even if you haven't used CSS, you have used it in order to do crazy stuff to, to make your uh, profile unique, right? You don't remember. So I remember. <laughs> I, yes, I remember. And um, all right. So uh, you you can see that um, our um, our web pages are not uh, completely blank. So they this button, for example, this increment button already has a a color, a, a white color, not a very special color. But if we go back to our editor and the, we can go to meetup card and we can edit it. Okay, uh, this is Vim, Anya. No, it is, it is Vim. The button is under home. Hmm? The button. The button. Is under home, not meetup card. Uh, I, it's it's Vim. No. Um, I cannot type. <laughs> okay. So, Visual Studio Code is a great editor. <laughs> And you can use it instead of any editor, any other editor you might like. It's PHP Storm, Wim, NetBeans, whatever you're used to using, you can use Visual Studio Code instead. And you install certain plugins, and it starts to behave like your old editor. Now, I'm going to give you a very short secret. Anya hates Visual Studio Code. She is a front-end developer, but she hates writing code in a user interface. She writes her code in the terminal using a terminal editor called Vim, VI. And um, we asked her kindly to start using Visual Studio Code for this class, because you're all used to it. And she installed the, the VI plugin. That kind of renders it impossible to use for pretty much any other developer, because it has, you know, when you want to type, it doesn't type. Those are actually buttons. When, when, whenever you are typing D, it is deleting the, the line. So it's a little bit difficult for us to use. That's why we kind of disabled the plugin to, that converts Visual Studio Code into VI. That was the backstory. Cool. Uh, all right. M maybe hair plus glasses plus this isn't a good combination. Please so. All right, so now what I have done, I have went to my meetup card dot view and I have done, I have added some HTML. So the meetup dot name, I have set it to H2. I have added an H2 uh, element and then a paragraph below. And please go on your uh, meetup card element and do this very small change. So what, what did we have? We see that uh, our styling has changed, has changed. So our browsers already have some styles inside. So what we use that, that, uh, that are defined by our HTML. So who knows what H2 means in HTML? Sorry? Exactly. So if we don't change, uh, our browser will already have some CSS, right? And um, what we will do, uh, what we are doing as front-end developers is just overriding this CSS and make things look uh, better. Uh, so I want to show you what is possible with CSS and then we will move to the coding part. Uh, I really want to show you. I don't know if you are, a, if you know this woman. She is Diana Andriana. She is an okay. Who knows her? 
Hey. It's, someone knows it, knows here. I, I hear the yes. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So this is very famous uh, the last few years across the web. And uh, I think I want to show you, this is all done line by line with CSS. Unbelievable, right? So you can, of course, follow here on Twitter. Uh, I want to show you what is the limit. I'm sure she's one of the best uh, engineers in the world right now, but uh, you want to see what's possible. Great. All right. So right now, what we are going to do, we will do some CSS warm up and we are going to style our bottom. So let's go back to home.view. And they, maybe if you want, you can move the bottom and the div below so it looks a little bit prettier. And please, uh, we can add a style tag here. Anyone knows what the scoped uh, attribute in the style tag does? Yes? Exactly, exactly. That's very much correct. And when you when you are going to build large scales, large scale application, you may hear a lot of front end developers have this problem that at one point and after the CSS is unmaintainable. So please, okay, maybe in this project is not very important, but it's very it's a great feature of you that it allows me it allows us to add CSS that will only apply to this component. All right. So um, the best practice uh, when we want to style a button is to add a class on it. So we will add a um, like button class here. Please go to your um, home.view and add a like dash button class in your uh, button element. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. That's increment button. Thank you, Anya. <laughs> increment. And um, what we are trying to do here is we will try to do the button the same style as the button on the meetup card. Okay, so can someone tell me what is different uh, from our lovely button, our lovely increment button with this button? Anyone? Sorry? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So initially we have a, the text has a different color, right? So. What we will do is uh, say color for simplicity, simplicity, let's just say dark cyan, right? Did it work? Yes. Anyone else that can tell me what's different with our button and the meetup attend button? Yes. And? Yes. All right. So can anyone, can you say how I can add some padding? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe 10 pixels, 20 pixels. Are you a front end developer? Nice, you are in a good way, in the, in the right, yes. 
Nice. So, and you said we it's more around, right? So there is a special property for that. It's called border radius. And we can set it to eight pixels. And we can also set the background color to white. Mm -hmm. So make sure you copy this code and then we, we, we should also write the border one pixel solid, also dark cyan. Mm -hmm. And then we are probably ready. Someone talk about the hover effect, right? So anyone can tell me uh, what is uh, how I can uh, edit the hover uh, element, the hover state? Yes, exactly. Double, yes. Uh, no, it doesn't work. It's okay. Okay, yes. And we, what, what are we going to do? We are going to revert the colors, right? So. What will be the color of the background? Anyone? Exactly. And what will be the color? White. Hmm? Let us check the result. Right. It's not that bad, right? It's not that bad. Any designers here? Anyone with a design experience? Yes. Right. Anything else uh, missing? Yes. Thank you. So let's say font size. Can anyone help me with a value? Okay, let's say 14 pixels and let, let's just also change the weight to 600. Right. And also adding cursor pointer. Okay, I will leave this code here so you will have the time to write it down, but uh, do not be intimidated by all these comments. Like CSS, nobody really knows CSS. So it's just, there are a few set of attributes that are repeated all the time. So any, a lot of attributes that start with text, that start with font, that start with a border, uh, these are very common. A lot of background uh, attributes, these are standard. Like after a few weeks, you will be able to just know them immediately. So. But uh, if you know where to go and uh, to find the good documentation, it's, it's, uh, it's not a problem. And of course, you can use the browser and you can inspect the element. And the uh, auto-completion, uh, when you try to write, uh, for example, when I try to write font, I can get so many recommendations. And what I really like is that uh, there are very, how would you say, um, how uh, there are very self-explanatory. Okay. Yes. Yes. So there are very semantic and self-explanatory. So you can also discover new comments. A lot of people learn CSS that way. They just, you can just use the auto-completism to discover new comments. Right, so please raise your hand if you have any questions or trouble following. And okay, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to see that. Uh, yes. Question here. Yes. Just a second. 
put the um, if it uh, if we have the goal to put the CSS uh, in a separate file or does it always stay in where we have it now? Great question. The question is whether we should separate the CSS files or not. This is a question for a century. We started discussing this in 1995 when CSS came out. Everything was in one file, one HTML file back then. And then we thought it was a great idea to separate them into multiple files because separation of concerns. CSS declarations in one file, JavaScript declarations in another file, HTML declarations in other files. And then we figured out that that is actually not a good way of separating concerns because CSS is not a different concern than JavaScript or an HTML, but the concern is building one block on the screen. That's why I talked about components. Back then, we didn't know about components. And then we figured out that the, the great way to split this is actually componentizing our, our page. And then everything related to one component should be all together. And we said, OK, these components should be very granular. I don't know. As a rule of thumb, you can say 150 lines long. Um, and if it's longer, it's maybe a better idea to break it down. And this includes both HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And then we said, you know, when you're changing a design or an implementation, you don't have to change multiple files. You're going to just change one single component. It's very easy to track, to review your code, review your changes. Um, and everything is self-contained in a box. That's why we don't separate right now. We don't separate styles into different files. However, this is still not a resolved problem. Like in React.js, there are two best practices. One is storing the, the styles in a different file. And the other one is putting them inside the component file. They even use JavaScript for CSS. So this is a whole mess. We're still discussing this for 25 years now. We couldn't decide on one thing. This is the, the best practice for view applications. Um, I personally believe this is a better way of building applications than separating them into different files. That's why we're um, doing it like it right now. Does it make sense? Any other questions? Since when it is best practices to combine them? Since I think three years, three or not even four years, probably three years. So it's very new. Um, that's why we cannot really tell if it's a best practice or not. I mean, it's a best practice to use cement to build buildings for 2,000 years. Um, that is what's called the best practice. This, we don't know. Maybe we're, we're going to change it in, in two years. It's still too early. Any other questions? We still have some more stuff to cover. Um, just saying, because it's 3 past 10 right now. So, you know, we're going to be here for a couple of more minutes. Any other questions? For the ones who are leaving, the homework is pretty clear, right? Build a front end for your applications. Maybe not for the entire application, but at least most of it, and make use of these store actions and mutations and stuff. So the homework is pretty clear, I guess, and short to tell. And hopefully, will require a lot of work from you. Um, <laughs> questions? No? OK, let's move on. Well, they are a little bit of experts, so we will wrap it up very soon, yes. I believe, because I didn't expect a front-end developers to, yes, right. So can someone tell me the, what, because I'm a little bit annoyed by the button and uh, my counter being that close to each other. Can someone tell me which attribute I can add so I can increase the margin? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one one fundamental thing is what's the difference between pad, padding and margin? Because before we used padding, right? Anyone knows? Another hidden front-end developer. Thank you very much. So yes, I you, you uh, okay. That that's great. So 
Now we added our margin. Please make sure you do the same. So now let's look at our inspector. So what do we have? We have our uh, navigation. We have our main page. We have some divs. We have a button and we have another div. All right. So one one important principle that you should have as a uh, developers is that um, our job is to try to make the web a little bit better. So a front a good front end developer is not only the person that does beautiful stuff. It's also the person that does accessible stuff that also respects the user, respect uh, the specificities of its country, and it's um, for supports as many devices as possible, and and stuff like that. And also, you are not only talking to humans that are uh, fully visually impaired. Uh, you are talking to humans that may have a uh, physical, visual, uh, any kind of impairments. So what these, a lot of these people use uh, machines to scan our website and they understand better the content. So uh, most websites out there are horrible for almost anyone apart from the fully abled person. And I really invite you to make this part of your ethics in your careers. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you are the most junior person in the room. It doesn't matter if you are an intern. Sometimes you will have to stand up and say, OK, in your code review, let's do this that way. And usually, you will notice that a lot of things are not that a big effort. So, for example, imagine that you are using a machine to scan this website. And you can see immediately like the content, but someone with a visual impairment would have a machine say, first div, nav, a link, text, home, go to next link, yes or no, yes link about text you see the pattern right so what we need to do is use semantic html anyone knows what semantic html is anyone knows a can tell me a semantic element in our inspector tab uh, mm -hmm. exactly uh, as a human if if you didn't know what main is what What's your assumption? Yes. Any any Java a person? Any <laughs> Java? <laughs> <laughs> Java developers. Yeah. Okay. So maybe a good parallel is a main a tag is in HTML. What a public static void main is in Java. Yeah. It is the main class to start your application or the, the entry point to your application. Yes. Yeah. And what, what our users, users are usually um, uh, want to read? It's the actual content. Uh, okay, maybe. But wait, main was an element that came up in the first part of the lecture as well. So that's like cheating. Is there any other semantic HTML elements that you know? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Caption, figure, header, nav. Yeah, these are all semantic elements. Th th that's. That's absolutely remarkable. So what we can do is uh, which one of these elements can we add in our application? Someone said nav. Do we have any kind of navigation in our app? Yes, yes. So let's go to our app.view and make things semantic, right? So let's change this to a nav. So a person that is looking for the links to navigate through the page will just say to the machine, OK, go, meet, go 
take me to the navigation element. Mm -hmm. And um, what else could we possibly use? Okay, we don't have a footer. Anyone knows the element article? Could we use this in our meetup card? So we could change this to an article. So what we have now is a, with so much little effort, what was it, one minute of effort? We directly, we made our application way more accessible. And uh, yes, I think for me, it's something that we shouldn't ignore as software engineers. And we have it in our uh, heart, in our values. And um, it, doesn't mean, it doesn't matter how technical our job is, but uh, your ethics will always show up in your work. That, that's uh, something um, I really believe that um, we should stress this again and again. So now we have our main, we have our navigation, and we have three articles and the bottom. So we, we are now ready to move, and la let's do some extra CSS to just create these cards, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. The comment is, there is a specific thing to view. In the template, you have to put everything inside one element. And here you see everything is inside the article element. Yes. I mean, sometimes this thing just doesn't work. No, it's, it's a very... The question is, what happens if you have to have multiple elements inside the template by design, or that's how you want to do it? Um, and the answer is very straightforward. You have to have one single root element. You cannot have multiple elements, multiple root elements in your template. If you don't have a parent div, you have to add a parent div, a, a parent container. So there is no other way. Yeah. Exactly. Inside the parent div, parent container, you can put whatever you want. You can put like 10 different things. So if you want to add, I don't know, we have the article here. If you want to add a mini footer to each article, it still has to go inside the article. If you don't want to put it inside the article, then you have to create a container around them, a main div, and then put it there. Yep. Cool. All right. So the last thing we can do is um, go back to our home and um, add some extra semantics. So we can see in our web page, we have two different related things. So we could use section semantic HTML to separate our meetup list and our button with likes because they are not related, right? So let's still stick to this HTML. Um, Right? HTML semantics. And let's also add some padding. So they have some space between. So with this command, like the first value is the top and bottom padding, as you said, and the left and right is zero. So if every one of you have done this, I can go back to our web page and see our remarkable result. Yes, it looks way better right now, right? Then we can really move on. So what we can do is um, 
Another thing, apart from accessibility, is that uh, nowadays uh, over half of our users are on mobile. So please, please, please keep that in mind. And also, it's a, a lot of older users are on mobile. My mom didn't have a computer since she was um, 15, like me. She, she, she started on mobile. So, and the mobile users are getting more and more and more, especially in developing countries. So, what, what really can help your life as a developers is to, to, to do mobile first development. So what I recommend you to do is uh, you have your Chrome uh, tab open and here near the inspect button, you have the toggle device toolbar. Anyone knows what a device, toggle device toolbar is? Okay, I spoiled it to you, but Anyone can tell me what is this tool? Anyone has used this tool before? Exactly, exactly. And uh, usually what I do, and it is a very good practice, is to use a... Um... Sorry, um, we kind of need to repeat mm -hmm. what the, the audience says for the recording, otherwise oh. it doesn't um, show up there in the recordings or for the online audience. Um, so if you could repeat the, um, the response. That's why I'm running around with microphones. Yes, so what you said is that um, with this tool, we can uh, see how our application is uh, rendered or in, um, in different devices, right? So a great thing now, we have the dimensions here. So we have a device with 414 width and 736 uh, height. So, so I think a good practice is to do iPhone 5 uh, slash AC or any device that has a width of 320 pixel. But why? Because the difficult thing is to do uh, to make things look good in when you have little space. If you do this effort and the result is good, then you will have very, very little problems later on. So let's go back and do some CSS and then um, let's go to our meetup card and change this to card. And then um, let's, uh, let's just try to, to make um, our meetup card look like an actual card. So what we could do is, first of all, we see all the text is aligned on, um, on the sender. Uh, very straightforward, we say text align, please align on the left, right? So we also say um, on the meetup card, we also see that, um, okay, the background used to be gray. Okay, let's say, um, yes, and let's do some um, padding. And then let's modify the heading. All right, yes, also let's add some border.
So, yes, with this one, two, three, four, five uh, comments of CSS, we immediately have some cards that look okay. So, uh, that, and we have already done the hard part, which is doing make it look good on uh, mobile devices. So we are already covering like 55% of our users. We have done with one minute work. We have made it accessible, more accessible than, than most applications out there. Um, so we are already very good to go. When we will exit the mobile view, we will see, however, that our content, okay, how do I, yes. So please, all of you exit the mobile view and you will see that uh, your cards will not look very good. Imagine if you render this page on a TV screen, like on, on your uh, home TV, it, 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 it will not be readable. So this can be very, very easily fixed. Just go to your home. Um, Okay, maybe in the card, what will happen if I add display in line block? No flexbox. <laughs> no flexbox. So um, maybe you can do flexbox on your own. Um, I'm I'm a huge fan of flexbox. Actually, I really recommend you to to read it out because if you understand the very basics of it. It will really save your life. So yes, please write it down. Maybe I can also share some resources for you, but you can really build production level, excellent applications, and it will really solve your hands. But now we, we don't have a lot of time. And the, the rule about Flexbox is you use it when you need it. If you don't need it, don't use it. For simple user interfaces like this one, you don't need Flexbox. Don't use it until you absolutely need it. Um, we talked about making our user interface accessible to users who need it, right? Simple CSS is accessible for engineers. There are backend engineers looking at your code. They will have to maintain your code. They don't have to know every single trick about CSS. So the simpler your CSS is, um, the, be the better for your fellow engineers. And Flexbox, frankly, is a little bit more advanced because it is meant to be used to build very advanced user interfaces. So don't use it unless you have to use it. For very complex views, yes, we have to use it because the alternative CSS would be much more complex. But here, a very simple display in line block actually solves this issue. Yes. Uh, thank you for the excellent uh, answer, Arman. And uh, I also, what I also did is uh, set a mean width of 200 pixels just for simplicity purposes. But uh, who was the person that mentioned Flexbox? This also is one of the problems that Flexbox uh, actually solves. You don't, you don't need to play with widths and stuff like that. It does it for yourself. Um, anyhow, uh, what I really, the last part, the almost last part uh, for me is to just uh, show you how to add an image and a font, uh, which, which every application out there needs an image, right? Unless you are doing, even if you do Wikipedia, or uh, you will always add some images. So, um, yeah, Wikipedia was a bad example because it really has a lot of images. But I think images is also very important and it's a very good example on how easy it is to make them a little bit, to make them accessible. So uh, we, will, we will go back in our component, uh, on our meetup card, and uh, who can tell me which HTML tag is used for images? Yes, image. And can someone tell me uh, an image? Okay, I wrote it. It's a habit. Like as a developer, I write this a lot of times, so I immediately write SRC. But we write SRC, and uh, I have the link somewhere. 
So because we don't have images in our database, in our case, we will hard code the, um, our image. So we will use an online service. It's called Lorem Pixum that it will select a random image for us. So please do me the favor and try to copy this. Not copy, but look and type, look and type. And then, um, ah, the, yes, that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. Let me check if this, yes. So now uh, we will have a few beautiful images, beautiful images that make our cards look amazing. So uh, this is a very good service. Please feel free to use it because uh, when you when we you do not afford, I guess, to hire designers and photographers for your view application that we, you will present in a couple of weeks. But uh, this, and I can also share you some resources later on where you can find good uh, palette colors uh, created by designers and where you can find icons for your web applications. So don't worry about that. You have done all the hard work. So you have set it up databases, you have done testing, you've done so many things. This is just, I want you to think the, that this is the, the rewarding part. That Because, okay, maybe the person that is sitting next to you will get excited by the local host 300 and make a person attend this meetup. But your friends and family, uh, they will not be super excited. But when you, yes. Th that's true, unfortunately, and um, as software engineers, a lot of times you will end up in situation when, okay, I cannot describe to my favorite people what I do for a living, right? This will be kind of common for you, but um, as a front-end developer, a lot of times you will be able to show off a little bit. And of course, as a full-stack developer, you will be even better. So uh, now let's move on a little bit and uh, let's, but let's say first that uh, the image attribute can also take an alternative, an alt uh, attribute. So when you have a production application, you really want your application to be crawled by search engines, right? So you really want, let's say we have uh, our images here that we have paid and worked hard for. We want them to show off in Google image gallery. So please, uh, and it's also we want uh, users to be able to understand what this image is about without having to be visual fully visually fully abled or um, the, the, the possibilities are limitless. So in this case, because we don't have credits for our images and they are random, we can just uh, leave it empty. But please, please, please uh, always um, write some text that describes the image and put some effort on it. And unfortunately, you will see a lot of times it is omitted because it is not considered necessary. But um, if you follow the best practices of handling image, you, you will see uh, how rewarding it is. So don't forget to do it. And after we have this um, image, we really want to add some fonts in our website, right? Because we want to, the, the typography is, a, if you ask designers, they get like, oh, it's the most important thing. Okay, as, as engineers, we, uh, we say, okay, they are important. So I want you all to go to, a, we will find, we will use the most easy way to add fonts in our web application. So we will use fonts served by Google. 
So I want you all to go to your browser and type font, type fonts.google.com. And uh, this will, we will add fonts in very, very, very simple steps. So we can just select a font, any font. Um, Yes, this one uh, should be good. And Google is very good on this. Uh, it shows us immediately what are the steps we need to take in order to show this font. First, uh, we just copy and paste this link, this, um, this code, and just put it, just go to your index HTML. So go to frontend public fo folder index html so i want you to to paste it immediately after um, the favicon icon so probably you haven't edited the index.html file add it on li line eight and once you are there anyway you can just uh, you can uh, change the title of the application to something else that it is more meaningful. So you can say Women Tech Makers Meetups. This is a very big, and also the title will be important. So if you if you want to, to publish your website in the world, which you will see in the next, um, in the next uh, course, which is deployment, uh, you want the title, you, you will, it will be the text that will, will appear in Google results that will be appear that will appear in previews when you share links in social apps in WhatsApp in Facebook so the title and attribute is important and also it's important for accessibility right when you you when you do stuff for your users you also gain SEO benefits you always you only gain benefits All right any questions Hey, did you all add it some fonts? No? Yes, do they work? <laughs> yes, of course they don't. So we, we still need to do a second step. So here they say specify in CSS. And what we, what we are doing is just go to app.view and change the font family. So instead for Avenir, Helvetica, Arial, Sans Serif, we just have the font family we, we requested from Google. And of course, we always need to have a backup, a fallback font, Sans Serif. So if, if an error happens with our fonts, internet connection is broken, still we will not have the ugly browser styling. So let's go back to our, yes. So we have our images, we have our typography. Uh, maybe it's already enough for now. Okay, uh, are you tired? I, you, you have the right to be tired. So one last thing, um, one very last thing, if it is your homework. <laughs> So let a uh, line five on app dot view change this to people and the URL to people. This is your homework to just make this link work. So what we did for our meetups, you have to do for uh, the people you have in your application. I will post a um, some code on how to do it uh, because we didn't have the time to do the routing uh, but this will be part of your homework that uh, and please have fun because this is a um, you ui this is front-end development you you it's the mean to communicate uh, your work to everyone else are we boring people on the back end <laughs> no, <laughs> you're full stack engineer, so it's impossible to, to be Just boring. Kidding. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you an example repository um, that has a little bit more code in it to 
allow you to go to the details of a meetup because we didn't cover that in the class right now. Um, so make sure you check the repository. We're going to write it on the Slack channel as well. Make sure you check the Slack channel and the repository for the updated code tomorrow. Um, it will be there. And you'll be able to go into the details of each meetup because that is what we did on the back end as well, right? We had the a URL for showing all the items in, in our database, and then we had another URL for showing the details of each item. We're going to do the same thing on front end as well, and we're going to ask you to do the, the same thing in your homeworks. Um, and obviously, we're also going to share the, the recording with you as soon as possible, as, as soon as tonight, if I will have the energy for it, um, so that you can start working on the user interface. And because next week we have Docker, which, is, which will be our last lecture, and we're going to talk about deploying these applications to the cloud so that you know, multiple people and our friends can experience these applications. And the week after, on December 10th, I guess, December 10th, uh, we're going to have the graduation day, which is the, the most awesome event of the year. It's going to be even a better party than, than Christmas with friends and family. So um, we're going to get together here and celebrate the projects that you all have built. For that, you need to sign up. We have shared, and we're going to share it again, um, a, an Excel sheet that, ah, sorry, it's a, it's a Google form. It's an Excel, Excel sheet for me. It's a Google form for you uh, because I see the results. Um, we will ask you to sign up on, on the Google form with your name, your project, um, what you want to do. It doesn't have to be a completely fully working project. Whatever you can do, it's OK if you skip the, wait, OK, it's not OK if you skip the front end. Please have some front end. Please have some front end, because we're giving you a lot of the, the groundwork already. Um, but it's, it's OK if it's not complete. It, it's, it's OK if you cannot demo everything in your application. That's fine. You're going to have about three minutes anyway. Um, and if you need help with presentation, I will be available all week um, and the next week as well, and we can we can talk about it. And you know, if you are worried that you won't be able to present, we're going to solve that as well. And we we just ask you to show what you have done in order to celebrate what you have accomplished because you all have done a great job. Um, so with that, please give another round of applause for Nora and Anya. And we're going to see you next week for the unbelievable, but for the final lecture. See you all.